I'm gonna share with you my fundamental principles of the velocity banking concept and how it can be used as your pregame work, your preparation, your positioning strategy before you start getting into these high level strategies that Joe is presenting. There's gotta be pregame work involved. There's gotta be positioning involved. And my, my angle is to help in that area with Joe and this whole entire, this entire weekend that Joe's been putting together for us. And so that's how I want you to view what I'm gonna share with you. This is all pregame positioning. And once you have it, anything else you do regarding your finances, you're always gonna keep this in mind because it's gonna accelerate anything that you do. It's gonna help you also think very differently about money, not just one-sided of any particular method, but rather it can authenticate whatever strategy you got going on. So if you're like, hmm, I wanna pay off debt, Joe, I wanna remove this mortgage, or I wanna remove this car loan, this student loan before I get engaged in this particular service, this particular investment, Velocity Banking can authenticate if that even makes sense. All right, so with that being said, let's take a look at the board. So before I do anything with any one of my clients, my subscribers, my viewers, people that know me, when we talk money, on a one-to-one, -one, I, I start here. This is principle number one for me is what are your numbers? We can't do anything unless you know your numbers, okay? The four major numbers is what's coming in, that income per month, what's going out, expenses, and I mean everything. You're tithing, you're saving, you're investing, your taxes, miscellaneous, bathroom products, house product, anything and everything that leaves your checking account, I consider that an expense. And then whatever is left over is my net free cash flow, right? A lot of people get this mixed up. They make 10 grand a month. They say they spend five. They're in debt a half a mil and they say they have cash flow of 5K. But then when I really look at their numbers, they're more like cash flowing 500 bucks. Why? Because they didn't account for tithing. They didn't account for taxes. They didn't account for the debt payments that they're making on certain stuff. And they also didn't account for their husband or wife making extra payments on top of the payment. So they just say, oh yeah, you know, we just pay a little extra here. So I'm like, no, no, no. We need to know where every single down to the penny, when you get this down, then I have a conversation with people. I've had multiple people pay me money and they tell me their life story. And I'm like, either, either you're going to share with me your life story or we're going to get into the numbers. I, I cannot proceed until I know the numbers. You can tell me where you come from and I, I had this issue and that and I got this money sitting here and this money sitting there and this going on. That None of that actually matters. I, I care about you, sure. And I'm, I'm genuinely concerned and wanting to help you, but it doesn't matter until I get this, right? You have no authority until you know this, the numbers. You cannot conduct yourself in, in business properly until you know this. So that is principle number one for me. If you're taking notes, know your four major numbers. What's coming in, what's coming out, what's left over, and then your debt. Now, if you're debt free, then it's really just your three. Um, but what I like to do is also know what access I have to debt. You know, say it's like equity in your home, a line of credit, you've got, you know, access to credit cards, multiple credit limits. I'll list that out as well. All right. Once I get past that, there's a couple other things that I usually like to know is how much cash on hand capital we have to work with in your, either in your emergency account, a, a cash value life insurance policy, a money market account, wherever it is, cash on hand, assets. What assets do you have? Not liabilities. What assets? And then what debt tools? Denzel, what's a debt tool? A debt tool is something that we can use under OPM, right? other people's money or in this case the bank's money through a credit card either personal or business a personal unsecured revolving line of credit which short is p lock or business line of credit b lock these can either be secured or unsecured same with credit cards then you have helocs home equity line of credit not home equity loan home equity line of credit either in the first 
or second position. Then you have all in one loan, which is pretty much the same as a HELOC. It's a first lien HELOC and it has a checking account function. Uh, it just makes the, it makes the HELOC a little more convenient. So all in one loan is another uh, a very prominent product in the debt tool industry. Then you've got HECMS, stands for Home Equity Conversion Mortgage. It's actually an insurance product. So it's an assured product, has a, a more safety than a, say, a second position HELOC. You don't have to worry about this getting canceled, shut down, or frozen on you because it's an insurance product. It's actually only available for people, I think, 60 plus or higher. So if you're below 60, then these would be your, your ideal products. And then there is a, another debt tool that's outside of banking products, and that would be cash value life insurance. So cash value life insurance, CVLI. Typically, you will come across the most popular ones are our whole life. You've got IUL, um, and then there's something called premium financing, but it's either gonna be a whole life product or an IUL. And those have a very similar function to a credit card, PLOC, HELOC, all in one. Essentially, debt tools to me is anything that gives me a revolving, keyword, revolving option where I have access to the debt, but I don't owe it, right? So I can have, say, a $100,000 HELOC line of credit, but I don't owe a hundred until I used a hundred, right? The minute I pull from it, that's when I owe it. What separates a debt tool from a loan or an amortized loan is a loan, amortized loan, when you apply for it, you immediately are in $100,000 of debt and there's no revolving feature to it. So I'm not able to pay it back and pull that same money I just paid with. So it does not give me a velocity effect. What is velocity? Velocity is the speed or direction in, in something that is in moving, right? So we're looking at the velocity of money, the speed at which my money is moving, and also we're looking at the amount of times that I can use that same dollar, right? So I usually like to, when I'm working with new clients, I say, if I have a dollar, right? You walk into the store, how many times can you use that dollar? And most people say just one time. Okay, and I say, well, what if there was a way that I can have a dollar and use it seven times before actually releasing the original dollar? Is that possible? Most of my Dave Ramsey clients are like, no, Denzel, that's not possible. I say, okay, well, we're playing in different ball games. You're playing a different monopoly, okay? I wanna share with you the game that the wealthy play, which is they take $1, they leverage it up to about seven times before they ever spend the original seed dollar. That $1 can eventually become 1.5 million, 1.5 billion, 1.5 trillion being leveraged multiple times before ever spending the seed dollar, the initial capital. And that's what velocity banking is looking to achieve whether we are paying off debt or leveraging debt to create streams of income. Okay, so that is key. Velocity banking has two functions, two main functions. Either debt reduction, which is very easy to, to learn, quite simple. Debt reduction, that's very, very popular and it's an alternative route to your debt snowball, debt avalanche. Dave Ramsey's seven baby steps method, debt reduction through velocity banking or debt leverage, okay? Being able to take the value of your business, say it's worth a half a million dollars and collateralize that to obtain 750,000, a million dollars line of credit through business credit that you build up over a period of time and then use that money to fund your business and create those streams of income. And if I'm only being charged 
three to four percent revolving, but I'm producing 25% or more in profits in my business, would you say your cost has been offset? I would say so. So this is more of a higher level. What I'm just gonna share with you today is the principle behind it. It doesn't matter what numbers you give me, right? And I'll, I'll give you an example. Doesn't matter what numbers you give me, as long as you know the principles, you can plug it into your numbers and then proceed, right? And you'll, you'll see how, how exciting it gets when you're able to run your own numbers right plug everything in and authenticate what you're doing and you don't have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to hire the you know the next fancy guru out there and i'm putting myself on the spot you know i'm considered you know one of the gurus in this space and yes people have paid me thousands of dollars to work with me that's awesome people want that hand holding process but i just want to give you literally like hey you just to be fully transparent and honest here you don't have to hire me to obtain this information, right? My assignment here on earth is to deliver it, right? And then either you're going to hire me through the ministry of the kingdom or outside of the kingdom, straight up consultation fees, coaching programs, you name it, all the different stuff that's out there. And then there's the DIY, do it yourself. You put the time, talent, treasure, your time, talent, treasure into it and you'll see what fruit you produce. Okay, so I just wanna lay that out there as well. Now, so far, recap, gotta know your four major numbers. That was principle number one. Know what debt tools are at our disposal for the banking options, the different banks. These are the different options. And then outside of the banks, we talked about cash value life insurance. Quick, not gonna spend too much time on that, but just wanted to show you all that is available, right? Once you have obtained your debt tool, another word is debt weapon, once you've obtained it, now we must determine the chunk. Okay, Denzel, what's the chunk? The chunk is the lump sum amount of money that we're gonna pull from your revolving line of credit to either what? Pay off debt or leverage the debt to create cash flow that pays back the line as well as creates profit offsets my borrowing cost right so how do we determine the chunk now that we know what the chunk is i have two sub rules to help me come up with that these rules i would say are standard you can't go wrong it really helps you from this over leverage can't tell you how many 40 50 60 year olds clients that i have that simply over leverage themselves in their early working years and now they're paying for it that's the consequence so these rules help prevent that if you violate the rule you know why right he's like okay if i'm you know if i have a hundred thousand dollar line of credit, we're going to use this example here, take 100K and we say, okay, 100,000. Rule number one is you take the limit of the credit line, you times it by 66%. That's 66,000. Okay, great. Then we take the second rule is cash flow. Got to know your numbers. You take your cash flow times that by 12. Let's say your cash flow in 2000 a month, two times 12. 24,000 okay the rule here would be all right whether we're debt reducing debt elimination or increasing income through leverage we should only leverage anywhere from as high as 66,000 or as low as 24,000 anything below that you, you're not really taking too much risk because it's it was your cash flow anyways it was money you were going to use anyways Right, so the idea is to leverage a little bit higher than what your cash flow is to put you in a better position. The more capital you have, the more damage you can do, either to yourself, <laughs> right? Or in the marketplace where you'd be rewarded abundantly for your time, talent, and treasure. So anywhere between 24 and 66K would be ideal. Now, the only time 
that I myself will violate my own rules is only when my cash flow times 12 exceeds 66% of my credit line. So those are my two rules. That would be my chunk range. What helps me authenticate my chunk range is knowing my numbers. If I make 10 grand a month and I spend eight, I cash flow two. All right. Um, and I'm talking to someone that's brand new to the concept. This number might be a little too much for them, especially if they're just trying to eliminate a debt. From that point, we look at what debt they have, you know, say they got a $30,000 car loan. They've been dying to get rid of the payments, 600 bucks. The interest rate is 6%, right? So there's a cash flow opportunity for to regain $600. Let's say your line of credit is at 4% and that's a say that's a second position HELOC, right? So we'll call it a HELOC. A lot of, a lot of my clients have these. So you got a second position home equity line of credit at 4%. Common sense would dictate, hey, six is higher than four. That's easy, right? So all you would be doing is what? Debt consolidation, moving the 30 into the 100. It's within your chunk range of 24 to 66. Talking to a new client, they'd feel comfortable with that. I'd say, hey, are you comfortable consolidating 30 into the 70, moving six to four? And then I'm gonna show you how to bring that four to zero. So your cost of borrowing is nothing, which leads into my next fundamental principle. So quick recap. Number one, know your numbers. Number two, what's your debt tool? Number three, determine your chunk. How? Take the limit times 66%, cash flow times 12, you have a chunk range. From there, it's based on your personal capacity to manage that debt, right? All with the goal of not over leveraging ourselves at any point in time, okay? One, two, three. Number four is Calculating cost, Denzel, we need to make sure that what we're doing actually makes sense and can put us ahead of inflation, taxation, devaluation. Most of the time, when you are taking the route of debt elimination, debt reduction, that is not going to be the case, that you'll be ahead of all three, inflation, taxation, devaluation. Maybe one of the three, maybe two of the three, but definitely not all three. So that's just providing you with simple fact, truth. No way of getting around that. Which then means, well, your other option would be increase your income, right? That's usually most of people's problems. But me as your personal finance geek, you know, I want you to think of me as cousin D, right? You've got grandpa Dave, You've got Uncle G, Grant Cardone, and then you've got Cousin D. Cousin D is like, hey, you come to me, what are you dealing with? What's your problem? Okay, you got, you've got, you explained what your problem is to me, I provide a strategy. I'm not necessarily gonna coach you, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. It's not my authority just yet. My place is to show you the strategy. I'm trying to meet you in your world where you're at. You might be at a Dave Ramsey stage, you might be at a minimalist, stage you might be one of those backpackers you go nomad across the world or whatever and you don't mind taking showers and, and you know wherever if you're one of those people or maybe you're you know like every every you know day american trying to keep up with the joneses i just i meet you where you're at right faith no faith in between i don't know somewhat so solve your problem build that trust once i have you locked in no like and trust now i'm going to start putting some pressure on you hey hey we should increase that income Hey, you're 50 years old. We ain't got much more time in the world here, okay? Yeah, your family, you know, has an average lifespan past 90, but working capacity, we may not have too much time. So we want to make sure that you've got that, we've got the right strategy over the next seven years. We're not blowing it, okay? So I try to, you know, solve their problem first, get them some debts paid off, get some momentum going. Okay, cool. Having fun. All right, and then I hit him hard. Say, you know what, you need to talk to a guy like Joe. All right, and you gotta, get, you gotta start getting serious. But in the meantime, again, these are just fundamentals. These will go with you through life. You pass it on to the kids. 
and you really, you can't go wrong. These are things you have to do no matter what your strategy is, right? So know your numbers, know your debt tools, determine your chunk, calculate costs. Here's where we're at on calculating costs. You take the balance of whatever your chunk amount was, in our case, 30,000, times it by the interest rate, 4%, right? So let's do that real quick. See what we get, 30,000 times 4%, is $1,200. That means that if I borrow 30,000 from my HELOC and only pay interest only payments, I will pay a total of $1,200 in that year. If I do principal and interest payments, say it's like the monthly minimum required, that number will actually be a little bit less, okay? That's the value of revolving versus amortize. Amortization front loads the interest, you get hit up front in the early years, towards the end is all principal. Revolving reverse, you can have all principal and no interest, and I'll show you how. So now you know 1200 is the most amount of money I'll spend on 30K in the HELOC. All right, the goal now is to reduce that to zero. So you take the 12 and you divide it by 365 days to get your daily rate, your daily borrowing costs. That's $3.28, right? And the following thing that we wanna do is try to figure out what the monthly cost of borrowing is to see how long it would take me to not just consolidate the debt into a new place, but to wipe it out, okay? The goal in Velocity Banking is once you know your numbers, your debt tool, you determine your chunk amount, you wanna be able to pay that chunk off within a six to nine month range, preferably. Anything past 12 months, you're now entering over leveraging territory. I get a little antsy, I don't feel comfortable, I don't feel safe. I like six to nine months because it's a little bit easier to project. Most people can project what's gonna happen in the next six to nine months, four to six months, but over a year, things can happen. I can get fired, I can lose my job, emergency can hit, so I don't like to leverage that far out, personally, okay? It's just one of my capacity rules. I don't have the capacity, personally, to do that. And I haven't come across much clients that have successfully done that. So that's how I measure the type of strategies that I'm doing. You know, working with hundreds of people now, everyday people, it, I haven't seen it yet. I've yet to see it. And when I do see it, the person's usually making six figures plus, seven figures plus, they're doing well for themselves. So I'm like, all right, I'm not gonna bother you. <laughs> so anyways, you take the balance, times it by the interest rate, you're gonna get a number, boom, divide that number, 365, you get your daily rate. Now you could take that number and just times it by 30 days, and you say, okay, the first month, the most I'll pay is probably $98.63. The goal is to bring that to zero, right? Let's say we're working with these numbers, making 10K, spending eight, cash flow in two. All right, and you did your first chunk of 30 grand, you wiped out a car, so you got now you have 600 more dollars in cash flow, that payment's gone, right? And you moved six to four, no matter what, you're now gonna pay less interest, less interest, no matter what, because you went from six to four, right? You consolidated debt, now here's where velocity comes in. Velocity comes in where you say, okay, I have the ability to now dump my entire 10K into the 30. So 30 is what I owe, 10K is what I make, so that's income going in, Expenses are now 8,000, right? And you minus your six, so you're at 74. That's my new expense number. Cash flow is now plus $600, right? And you're like, wait a minute, Denzel, what about the payment on the HELOC? Watch it, watch it, here's what's gonna happen. You're not gonna have a payment on your debt tools. That's another beautiful thing with these types of debt weapons is you can eliminate or at least push out the payment because your income is the payment. Your income sits in the debt tool ahead of when the due date actually occurs, right? Whenever you obtain a credit card, a HELOC, usually your due date is roughly 25 or so days out, your first payment upon using it, right? So you have that time to dump your income in to manipulate that four all the way down, right? 
So $30,000 is the highest that I'll owe on the HELOC, which means I'll pay $3.28 for however many days I owe 30 grand, which means the most ideal time to pull that 30K out is around the time I have most of my income. For most people, getting paid on a bi-weekly, monthly, weekly basis, usually the most amount of money people have is towards the end of the month, beginning of the first month, beginning of the next month. So it's either at the end of the month, why? Because you've paid all your bills and you have a remaining cash flow. And then the first week of the month, you get that paycheck. That's, the, that's a nice, beautiful window right there. You wanna have the most amount of money to put right back into the HELOC upon withdrawing. Step one, I withdraw 30K. Goes into my checking account. Step two, 30K, boom, pays the car, done. See ya, wouldn't wanna be ya, right? I get paid my income, let's just say 10K all at once, first of the month. Let's just say that's how someone, people get paid on a monthly basis like that. So let's just roll with that to make it pretty simple. 10,000, immediately, upon that checking account, the money lands into your checking account, transfer, boom, right back into the HELOC. So minus 10, balance will come down to 20. And then you do your calculating costs again, times 4%, uh-oh, now we're down to eight. Divide by 365, you're at 219. Now you got expenses. All throughout the month, you're gonna be withdrawing money as you need, when you need it to pay your bills, right? And I'm gonna make it even sweeter when I talk about the final rule, which is offsetting your costs, which is where people get really excited. Right? They're like, oh my God, I can borrow from Peter to pay Paul at 0%. This is awesome. So 20,000 was the number. The expenses are $7,400 moving forward. Why? I no longer have to withdraw $600 out of the HELOC so the money's just gonna stay there. Pure 100% principal dollars, 600. That is a primary difference, again, between amortized and simple, okay? So plus 7,400 over a 30 day window, the balance goes back up, should end around $27,400. Do the math, right? Calculate your cost. Time balance times 4%, boom. Divide by 365, $3. Now we wanna get the monthly median rate. Add the three, divide by three. Taking it back to middle school, right? $3 plus 219 plus 328, $8.47. Divide by three, uh-oh, $2.82 is my average daily rate, assuming every 10 days, right? 10 days that I owe 30K, 10 days I owe 20, 10 days I owe 27.4. Assuming that, that's actually not the case. But I did it this way to provide overestimated numbers. And when I draw it out for my clients, they actually do better than what I present to them. They start standing different. You know, they're like, they start walking different. You know, wife says, oh my God, husband looks a little more handsome today. I don't know what's up. You know, you, Things, things change, right? So that's what that's how I do things, right? To just get people excited, man, because get the juices flowing, right? Get the energy back. You were like, oh my God, I didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but now I do. And you're like, oh my goodness, hallelujahs. That's what I'm after, right? So I just brought 98.63 to 84.72 as my estimated median monthly rate first month. Your first month, is your most expensive month. Every month thereafter, the number drops. It'll eventually drop to zero before you even pay off the 30. This is the amazing part, is I'm only gonna have interest for about maybe three, four months. After that, it becomes offset. By what, Denzel? Hmm, we're gonna use these fancy little credit cards that are offering one to 3% cash back. So let's go with down the middle, Use an example of 2%. Client has expenses of now $7,400. Let's say half of that is money that can be paid with a credit card without any fees, balance transfers whatsoever. 
no additional fees. That is your food, gas, miscellaneous, house products, bathroom products, phone bill, car insurance, possibly your internet expense, possibly your gas bill, your garbage bill, eating out, dining out, you name it, right? A lot of different things that can be run on a credit card nowadays. Let's say it's $3,700 and you're getting 2% in cashback rewards each and every month. So you're gonna average, say $74 a month, right? In cashback rewards. What then happens, the way I do it personally, is I run the 3,700 in expenses on the card. 25 days later, I owe, what? 3,700 is my statement balance on the credit card to avoid any interest. I apply my cashback rewards that same month to the balance, 74 bucks, it reduces it. Then I make a transfer from the HELOC, right? From the HELOC to pay the credit card off in full on the due date, which means that I now have 3,700 more dollars staying in the HELOC, manipulating that borrowing costs even lower. Uh-oh. So we go from 8472 minus 74. Oh man. Denzel, borrowing costs, $10.72 for the first month. By the second or third month, your borrowing cost is now zero because every preceding month you're getting these cashback rewards on your credit card statement. Whatever you pay in the HELOC, boom, gets offset by the cashback rewards and the fact that you moved a higher rate to a lower rate. And then if you really wanted to do the math behind, okay, what was my actual cost of borrowing in those two to three months at that 4% rate? My friend, you go from four to an effective rate of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, right? Percent borrowing costs. This would be a successful example, successful case study. And that's all I look for to determine whether this makes sense or not. The fact that you recover 6% amortized interest, which is in fact, it's not six, it's more like 15, 22 over a long period of time, that helps me just break even with inflation, right? So again, going back to those three things, inflation, taxation, devaluation, I at least solve the one, which was inflation. I stay ahead of that or at least break even right? Taxation devaluation, we got to focus on obviously increasing income to stay ahead of that. But again, this is just positioning. One, two, three, four, five principal steps, whether you're leveraging debt to pay off debt or leveraging debt to increase income, you're going to have to go through these steps somehow, right? And this is how I lay it out for my clients. Five, boom, 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 do the math. You don't need to pay $5,000, $7,000 for some fancy software, simple calculator on your phone, or if you're old school like me, you write it on a whiteboard.